In this video, I'm going to talk about writing for social media and the idea of short form storytelling. In particular, what we're going to cover this week is how to write for social media and the role of um, non-text media like visuals and video in those short social updates. Some of the other factors to consider like timing and relationships. And finally, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on narrative structures in short form social storytelling. So let's begin, first of all, by emphasising that when I talk about writing for social media, we're not talking about one platform and one technique. Different social media platforms have different preferences, different algorithms, different audiences, and you should treat each one differently. I'm going to focus particularly on Twitter and a little bit on Facebook, but obviously there are dozens of other social platforms as well, and each one should be looked at separately. And we'll cover some of the things to consider when doing that. For example, Twitter tends to favour very um, up to the minute updates, things that are happening now. These are some of the most shared stories in 2014 on Twitter, for example. Facebook, on the other hand, tends to favour less time sensitive content, more personality driven, more um, long term evergreen content as well. And that's just those two major platforms. So what works on social media platforms and Twitter in particular? Well, first of all, anything visual is going to have a big impact on the likelihood that someone's going to retweet your tweet. We can see here in some research by Twitter um, some time ago that different elements in a tweet have a different impact on the likelihood that it's going to be retweeted. So hashtags are useful, um, videos are useful as well, just a URL. Numbers actually have a big impact and quotes are even more effective. This makes sense if you think about it, a, a tweet that has a number or a quote indicates some sort of factual basis, some sort of original um, information. But photos performed better than all of those. And of course photos um, are themselves outperformed as well. So images, um, tweets with images tended to get three times more engagement than text, but GIFs were even more effective than images and video was even more effective than GIFs. So consider moving images rather than just images, but if you can't get moving images then certainly something visual is going to be better than text. And certainly in text itself, aim to have quotes or images or numbers and elements like that, hashtags and so on. Now when it comes to the text, look for verbs. Um, verbs tell us that something's happening. Verbs are basically movement in a story. So you should apply that same principle to tweets as well. Tweets with verbs tend to perform better. Equally, making a bit of effort to customize your um, story title or your story generally for the web for Twitter is going to be more effective. We can see here two examples from the New York Times. In the top example, they um, just took the headline and repeated it. Uh, sorry, in the bottom example, they just took the headline and repeated it. In the top example, they rewrote the story for Twitter. And you can see in the top example, a story is being told there. This isn't just a headline. And that's a good principle to adopt generally when it comes to social. Don't write headlines on social tell stories. Here's another couple of examples. Clarity and straightforwardness seem to be more effective in this organization's experiments. Another thing to consider is um, using images to get around the text limitations. In this example we've got an interview with a celebrity. Um, the quote in that image would possibly be too long for the tweet. So putting that quote into an image alongside a photo is one way to get around that. And we can see that the tweet itself is nice and short, um, possibly too short actually, I don't know if this is really telling a story, but it's an example of that approach. One thing to bear in mind with images is that um, if you don't size your image specifically for Twitter, Twitter will crop that image to the um, specifications that the platform uses. Now you can use a platform like Canva 
a tool like Canva to create images that are the right dimensions for Twitter. But if you're not doing that, then one thing that's worth knowing is that Twitter will crop images to focus on text. The other thing is that it will crop them to focus on faces as well. There's been some interesting developments recently with this particular algorithm where people have realized that the um, machine learning algorithm that's used to do this actually has a racial bias and white faces are prioritized over non-white faces. Twitter have recently announced that they're going to um, address this algorithm. But again, it's a good example of being aware of how image cropping algorithms work on social media platforms. Timing is another factor and you'll come across uh, if you look around lots of research about when is the best time to tweet, when's the best time to post to Facebook, when's the best time to post to LinkedIn and other platforms as well. This is a good example of an area where platforms do differ quite a lot. People check Facebook at different times to Twitter and LinkedIn and so on. But also different people check social media at different times. Um, so really there isn't a hard and fast rule about when the best time is to tweet or post an update on social media. Um, what is important is to consider trying to find out through experimentation what is the best time for you and for your audience and for your content. So for example content that has audio in it um, is probably best done outside of working hours because people are less likely to watch video with sound while we're at work. But video with captions you might be able to um, use during working hours. But either way you will have different audiences who commute to work at different times for example or check their um, email newsletters at different times and so on. So trying different times of the day, seeing the effect, experimenting and measuring how successful your updates are is a very important strategy. And in fact, that testing approach to social media is really important as well. You should be looking at your analytics, your measurements on social media. On Twitter, you can find this at analytics.twitter.com. You can download all of the analytics for your tweets, when people have viewed them, how many times, what sorts of ways that they've engaged and so on. It's also worth um, deciding whether you want people to simply see your social media updates or if you want them to engage in some way such as retweeting um, or replying and so on. Now on this front it's worth pointing out that there's nothing wrong with repeating a piece of social media content more than once, particularly on Twitter. Um, this was an experiment that one person did tweeting the same tweet four times in 32 hours and, and seeing if it actually had any impact on whether people got bored with it. What they found, found is that actually it didn't have that much impact. People who saw it the tenth time it was tweeted hadn't actually seen it the first time or the fifth time or the ninth time. So it is possible to um, tweet the same stuff more than once. So having gone through uh, all of those kind of considerations in terms of Twitter in particular and social media in general, here are nine things to check to, to kind of go through a checklist every time you're creating some content for social media and Twitter in particular. The first is to check whether it has something visual, a video ideally or a GIF or failing that an image um, and so on, even some emojis. Secondly, does the text of the tweet or the update not read like a headline? Make sure it reads like a story. Thirdly, is there some sort of call to action? A call to action would be something like meet the person who, or read about, or see how, or watch, or listen, and so on. So it's, it's something that invites the reader to take some sort of action with respect to your content, whether that's watching it or the people involved, so meeting the person that you've interviewed, for example. Have you considered hashtags? Not too many, but make sure that um, if they're relevant, then at least one is in there. Likewise, does it name people involved? Um, hashtags are one thing, one way that people can discover your content if they're not following you. 
Another way that they can discover your content is if other people are retweeting it and um, or if they're named in the tweet themselves. So if you have interviewed someone, then make sure you use their Twitter name and at them in the tweet. Um, ideally, don't do this in, in, a, in a way that's clunky. So if you uh, name the person in the story, then just use the at name rather than their non at name, if you like. This will bring it to their attention and make it likely, more likely that they're going to retweet it and bring that to their audience. Think about whether your tweet tells a story. Does it have a beginning and an end? Likewise, does it use quotes or numbers? These are quite useful techniques to um, make it more likely to be retweeted. Have you considered timing in the way that you tweet? Maybe even trying different times. And likewise, are you trying different versions of the tweet? You might try one that uses quotes, one that uses numbers, one that uses a GIF, one that uses a video and so on, and see which ones tend to be most um, successful. Once you've identified the most successful ones, those are the approaches you can continue to use in future or indeed to inform further testing. Now, another thing to consider with the use of social media is to what extent you tweet about your own work and to what extent you tweet about other work. Some researchers found that um, if you have a balance between sharing your own content and sharing other interesting things, that tends to be more successful than if you're only sharing, only sharing your own stuff or, or only sharing stuff by other people, what's called the curator role. So consider um, sharing a mix of material rather than merely promoting your own content. Now moving on uh, momentarily to Facebook, it's worth pointing out some particular characteristics of that platform. The first is that it's important to invite people to engage with your content on Facebook. Um, how engaged they've been with that content is a factor in how likely they are to see that in future and indeed how likely it is that other people will as well. So you might invite people to like your post or vote on a poll or do something in particular. Again, thinking about that call to action. Similarly, analysis in a Facebook post tends to be quite successful as well. So don't be afraid to write longer posts on Facebook. Um, they can receive more attention. Now Facebook, like uh, most social media platforms, has its own algorithm and uses its own factors to uh, rank and order the content that people see. The average Facebook user, for example, would be shown more than 2,000 pieces of content every day if Facebook merely listed them in um, chronological order. But that's not what Facebook does, and indeed that's not what Twitter does either anymore, really. Um, both platforms and others use a number of factors to order content. So this isn't just a Facebook uh, factor. Now, Facebook uses an algorithm which is sometimes called edge rank by people outside the organisation. It's not called that inside Facebook. But um, the Facebook algorithm takes into account a number of factors, and some of the main ones include uh, the item itself, um, so whether it's got video or audio or links or what sort of text is involved, um, how new it is, so what time it was published, what sort of interaction it's had, um, so whether people have uh, liked it or engaged with it or so on, you could call this engagement, and uh, your connection with it, your affinity if you like. So in other words, if this uh, Facebook update is from someone that you have interacted with in the past, then it's more likely to be shown to you, regardless of the content itself. Likewise, if it's shared by a friend, then it's more likely to be shown to you. Um, or if you just looked at those updates, then it's more likely to be shown to you. So that history of interaction is one of a number of factors, along with timeliness, the update itself and the qualities of that, and what other people have, uh, how other people have engaged with it. Those all come together. So it's worth thinking about your content and whether it's content that people are likely to interact with in some way, to engage with, 
whether you're publishing at the right time, so it's going to be new when people are checking Facebook, whether it's the right type of item, so you're using video, for example, and whether people have a history of interaction with your page or account. And that history of interaction is really important. Trying to build a relationship with your audience is part of the process. It's not just about the content itself, but actually the relationship that your social media account or page has with the audience. So let's move on finally to narrative structure in short form writing. There are a number of different approaches you can take when writing in a social media context when you've got a limited number of characters or a limited amount of attention from the audience. The simplest is to adopt a linear chronology to describe the events of your story in the order that they happened. But often you might instead want to think more in a more sophisticated way about having a beginning and an end or an introduction and a twist. A couple of simple examples here are Texas Man Returns to Floodlit Home, that's your beginning, Finds Terrifying Intruder Inside, that's the twist. So consider what are the two parts of your story that you can tell on social. Another approach is to have action, then some sort of hook, and finally a resolution. This is quite difficult to have three stages in a story with limited characters, but here's one example of that. I've done some data journalism, that's the action. Ed Miliband is wrong about Fredo's, that's the hook, okay. He's wrong, what happens next? Maths proves it, so that's the resolution. And we'll read the story to find the full story. You can also obviously use threads to string together a number of updates into a longer story. That's another way around the character limit. What's important to emphasize here is when you move from the individual social media update to a thread, you're moving from one genre to another and you're moving into a story that needs to consider sequence and also the genre format. Often the thread signals its presence with the word thread and with numbers against each update. Now in this particular example, um, Ignacio Lopez doesn't actually do that. He doesn't signal that this is a thread. So if you encounter any individual tweets, you'd have to understand that this is part of a bigger story. But actually he writes this story so well that you would realise that. And it's a, a fantastic example of story construction. If you want some more ideas for um, narrative structures on Twitter and social media more generally, uh, this article, if D Don Draper tweeted, is well worth reading. You can see the address in the bottom right there and um, in these slides on Moodle. And some final tips on storytelling for mobile uh, in social. Using emojis, obviously, as bullet points can help. Having short text, strong visuals, having a personality really helps. Humour obviously goes very far. And on some platforms, consider the role of swiping and scrolling in your content. Emojis, obviously, and we've mentioned the importance of analysing your analytics, the data about the performance of your content and adjusting based on what you find works and what doesn't. So just to round up the key points from that video, first of all, make sure every word counts on social. You've not got many of them and you've not got a lot of attention to take for granted from your audience. So think about using verbs, think about using numbers, think about using quotes use hashtags and app names as well and um, use those words effectively don't waste words on you know what you did to get the interview just tell us about the story of the interview once you've written the words you've got a second stage of visual illustration how can you add to those with video or a gif or an image and also thinking about emojis and other elements as well Secondly, remember it's not just about the content, it's about the audience's relationship with the social media account that you are posting to. So consider the relationships that that audience has with your um, account and how you might build that. So you might um, use content that creates 
relationships and actions and reactions such as votes and polls that are very successful in building Bohr's uh, connections from an algorithmic point of view, um, inviting response, asking questions, engaging with audiences online, or indeed thinking about content that is going to engender a reaction from that audience. And finally, don't ever think of social media as a place to promote your content. This is probably the number one mistake I see people make when they go on social media. They think, I've made a video, or I've written a story, or I've recorded a podcast. I'm going to go on social and promote it. Do not do that. Go on social media and tell a story. That's what you're effectively doing. And tell that story in a different way that's going to suit that platform. And indeed, that's what you're doing on this module. You're going to tell a story across a number of different platforms. So if you produce a podcast as one of your elements, you might tell a story about that podcast on Twitter or Facebook as another element. So I'll never try to promote, just tell the story. And that's the best way to promote and get people engaged in your story. You can find some um, extra reading on this subject on Moodle, chapter five. Uh, from my book on writing for social media and chat apps and this covers uh, a lot of these techniques and others in more detail.